don't know if you ever thought about this. I have. I thought there'd be, uh, there's, there's some things in the Bible that I would like removed. Right? Isn't there like some things you think, I don't know if, like if I was writing that, like if I was writing the Bible, I would take that out. Anybody have some verses like that? I mean, it just kind of bothers you a little bit. It's like, that doesn't make any sense. Or why would they put that in there? Or kind of like doing that. Um, right? Is there certain things in there? He's like, gosh, I don't know. Is it really that big a deal? And so, yes, let's remove some stuff. And, uh, and, and the passage we're talking about today is one of those things I'd have taken out. I would have taken out. Maybe not for the reasons you think, right? But, but, uh, but let me tell you why. Here we go. Let's take a look at 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 5. We're talking about the Dave, King David, heart of a champion, and uh, man after God's own heart. Here we go. In the spring of the year when kings normally... This is normal, this is normal. They normally go out to war. David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Late one afternoon after his midday rest, because it's rough being king, and I'm gonna have to take a nap now. Isn't that great? He's like, Oh, yeah, I kind of had a busy morning. I'm going to go take a nap. But when you're king, you can do that. All right, hey, I'm going to need an hour power nap thing. Here we go. Late afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. He looked out over the city and noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone to find out who she was. And he was told, that's Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. And when she came to the palace, he slept with her. She had just completed the purification rites after her menstrual period. Okay, do we need to know that? <laughs> All right, he's like, that's part of it. Like, well, let's just take that out, right? Like, that doesn't, too much information. Probably written by a man. So, she had just completed the purification rites after her menstrual period. She returned home. Later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, I'm pregnant. Now, the reason I would have excluded this passage is not because of the adultery thing, right? Probably if you were writing, you know, coming up with your own religion, uh, you would put in there adultery bad, right? If m most people, like you're writing your own religion, you're coming up with some rules and regulations that you would have said, cash adultery, Ugh, no. Um, now some religions, some people might come up like, well, if it's between two consenting adults, and by the way, if the partners agree, like, hey, they come together, like, you know, eh, it could be fun, uh, I'm okay if you want to do it. I'm not going to throw you out. I'm not going to divorce you. You know, you can do it if you want. Just have fun. You know, like, just don't let me know or whatever. You know, and, but, and so that's, you know, people work those things out. But most people in a, in a religious kind of world would say, gosh, uh, adultery. Uh -uh. Now, the reason I wouldn't include it in this, in the, in the Bible that I would have written, would be because David's one of our heroes, He's one of the top dudes, right? He's man after God's own heart. We're kind of making him look like a sleazeball. We don't want our heroes looking like sleazeballs, right? So let's just make David look like a good guy. Let's not include this. I know it happened, but we're going to pretend it didn't. And just kind of exclude that from the uh, record because he's a man after God's own heart. And if a man after God's own heart is doing this, and then what about the rest of us? You know, like, oh, golly. So let's just take it out. But the best, one of the best things about the Bible is it does not paint that picture of our heroes. Our heroes have lots of flaws. Our heroes mess up. Sometimes really bad. So the Bible says this is who we are. This is what we're like. This is... And, and, and so I'm kind of glad that he does this. Now, David, 
Uh, in fact, no sin outside of Adam and Eve's sin is talked more in the Bible than David Bathsheba. You know, so this is a, important. Now, David's in his 50s. He's an accomplished leader. He's a general. He's wealthy. He's a songwriter. He has led the nation back to God. The songs of praise towards God are filling the nation now in worship and in the halls of homes. And the blessing of God is on the nation and everything's advancing. And David is doing great. And though everything seems awesome, David has ignored some instructions from God about how kings are to behave. Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 17 says, you are about to enter the land the Lord your God is giving you. When you take it over and settle there, you may think, hey, we should select a king to rule over us like the other nations around us, which is exactly what happens. If this happens, but it does, be sure to select a king, the man the Lord your God chooses. You must appoint a fellow, here's the rules, you must appoint a fellow Israelite, he may not be a foreigner. The king must not build up a, a large stable of horses for himself or send people to Egypt to buy horses. For the Lord has told you, you must never return to Egypt. Okay. The king must not take many wives for himself. Why? And it's like, why? Why would that be bad? Why can't I do that? I'm king. And why is this a problem? Here's what he tells us, because they will turn his heart away from the Lord. Oh, huh. I just didn't think he wanted me to have fun. I mean, he's kind of a cosmic killjoy, a guy that he's like, well, you know, I know that feels good, but eh. he gives us a very specific, this is going to mess you up. All right. And he must not accumulate large amounts of wealth in silver and gold for himself. Now, David does pretty good about the horse thing and the money thing. But he messes up on the wife and girlfriend thing a lot. And again, you know, that doesn't seem like a big deal. You know, it's like um, what happens in the bedrooms shouldn't affect what happens in the boardroom. As long as the economy's going well, as long as we're, we're, everybody's progressing. In fact, uh, you can kind of even forgive our leaders when they do these things because, shoot, my 401k is doing awesome. I got more cattle and things and stuff and house and a boat and a car and a, this is great. I don't, you, whatever you're, don't even care what you do in private. Because you're awesome. And I suppose if we were to ask David, why did you do this? I mean, God told you, and he said, maybe he would have said this. Because I can. I'm king. You notice that when people are in power, have a little bit of power. We do things because we can. As long as he's running the country, let him have a little fun. Let him have a little fun. It's not a big deal. But here, one afternoon after his midday rest, David got out of the bed and was walking on the roof of the palace, and he looked over the city, and he noticed a woman, and did you catch this, of unusual beauty. It's not, and again, when the Bible says something like this, this is, they mean it. It's like, uh, some translation says she was very beautiful. I mean, they inject the word very. Uh, they don't throw that word around. They don't like, oh, she is okay. Uh, you know, it's like, well, it's kind of plainly. No, she is gorgeous, right? She is really, really good looking. And the Bible emphasizes this for a reason. So for some reason, she is bathing where people could see her. I don't know if she was careless. I don't know if she was calculated. After all, her husband has been away at war. She's lonely. I don't know. I don't, really don't know. But what we do know is that David and Bathsheba were vulnerable. For whatever reason here. And David, by the way, check this out. David in all his godliness... I mean, he's the man after God's own heart, right? We know he's super, right, in touch and in tune with God. 
David in all his godliness couldn't handle it. So what makes you think you can? Don't play with that. We're not in David's league. And there needs to be safeguards and super things that are in place in our lives because given the right, it's like, well, we're in trouble. He couldn't stop thinking about her. And he, he, uh, even though he had, even though that David had more than he needed, right? He had more than enough. He had a lot of wives, a lot of women. And, the, and, and, and that wasn't enough to fulfill whatever was going on in his head. I don't have her. And for some reason, now again, David doesn't hate God. He doesn't hate God. He just forgot about him. That's why the Bible says we have to flee idolatry, flee the lust of this world, flee fornication, because if David can't handle it, you and I can't either. David has to find out about who this person is, and so he goes onto Facebook, checks it out. Checks her profile. Actually, in the, in the, he says, you know, okay, hey, can you, says to a servant, can you, can you find out who lives right there? Uh, which house, that one? Uh, yeah. And this was crazy. I thought this was interesting, is that, that, that the servant comes back and says, that's Bathsheba, daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. He doesn't just come back and say, that's Bathsheba. <laughs> totally get it, dude. He says, and I don't know if this is a subtle thing here. I don't know if he's trying to warn. I don't know if he's trying to drop a hint here to the king. He says, that's the daughter, right? It's somebody's daughter. It's Iliam's daughter. You know Iliam, he, right? It's his daughter. And he's married to Uriah. That's Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Bathsheba. He just blows past that. He doesn't even care. I don't care if it's somebody's daughter. I don't care if it's somebody's wife. Could you have her come over here for a little? Like, I just need to talk to her. Sure, because you don't say no to the king, right? You, you don't tell him, dude, that's a bad idea. I don't think you should be messing with somebody's wife. I don't think you should be, right? Okay, yeah, I'll go get her because I'm not going to die on this one. I'll go get her. He's handsome. He's rich. She's beautiful and flattered. It appears that maybe that we, as far as we know, she only had, they only had this one night thing going on. She sneaks back home. Bob Seger said it like this. I used her, she used me, but neither one cared. We were getting our share. The pleasure of this moment doesn't seem to last too long because in a short period of time, Bathsheba sends message to the king that she's pregnant. Satan never warns us on those things, right? It's like he doesn't put a warning label on sin. He doesn't say, oh, hey, you're gonna love this, but this is gonna be a problem. You know, so you're like, this is gonna be, this is gonna, this is gonna be great. You're gonna love it. It's gonna be super hot. He's like, oh, you're gonna be intense. It's gonna be mystical. It's magical. Uh, oh, and by the way, here's the consequences to those things. He never comes up with the warning label, right? He doesn't. In fact, after we do it, he kind of moves on. He's like, I'm sorry about that, dude, but I... <laughs> He doesn't warn me about a hangover the next morning or the fact that I might lose my family. He, Satan is actually totally absent after the sin. Satan smiles at that moment and moves on, thinking now that these two people have gotten away with it, the word comes, I'm pregnant, and David's head is spinning. What is he gonna do now? And he really only has two options. Confess or cover up. Those are the options, confess or cover. Complain, seek counsel, seek the Lord, admit, or figure out some other way. 
David chooses two, the second option. He calls for Uriah to come home. Here's his strategy. I'm bringing Uriah home from the battlefront, you know, get him a little R&R, you know, have him come home, you know. As soon as he sees his wife, he's going to have sex with her. This is going to be great. And, you know, nobody in our country can count to nine really well. They don't know. It's like, this is happening. You know, like, okay. And so maybe everybody will just kind of, like, oh, that was quick. So he brings Uriah home. He sends for him. He comes back. And uh, David's plan seems, thinks it's going to work. But Uriah says, I- I'm not going home. And he sleeps at the door of the palace as a soldier, right? And he's not going to go home and enjoy um, when his battle buddies are dying on the battlefront. I am not going to have sex with my wife while my battle buddies are fighting a war. I'm not going to do it. He has too much honor. So David finds out that Uriah does not go home, and David, golly, dude, you go home, you have some sex, this would be great. No, I'm not going to do it. So here's David's next step. This is crazy. I'm going to get Uriah drunk. Let's get Uriah drunk, and then he'll go home and have sex with his wife because he's not thinking straight. So he gets him drunk, right? Okay, all right. Dude, <laughs> hey, that's fun. Have a good time. Have fun with <laughs> whatever her name. I don't know. Go have fun. But Uriah doesn't do that. He sleeps right in the same spot. That dude is like, golly, oh, I can't. Because again, Uriah is a man of honor. So David's option is, well, gosh, what do we do now? Well, I think we should probably send Uriah back and we can put him in the front of the lines and maybe he'll die. So he sends Uriah back with a note to give to the commanding officer. And Uriah is a man of honor, so he doesn't look to find out that here's the instructions. And so he's instructed now to put Uriah in the front line. And at the heat of the battle, he's pulling back his troops, and Uriah is going to die. Sure enough, Uriah dies. A little bit of mourning takes place in Jerusalem. And check this out. 2 Samuel eleven twenty seven. 27. When the period of mourning was over, David sent her for her, Bathsheba, and brought her to the palace, and she became one of his wives. She gave birth to a son, but the Lord was displeased with what David had done. One translation said, David did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Lust and adultery and hypocrisy and murder. How could he have fell to such a level? Well, there's a couple of things they've kind of gotten away with it, but David is miserable. We see some of his writings and his songs. Psalm uh, 32 says, When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. Day and night your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Sleepless nights and haunting decisions that were so far from God. This great man of God had committed this sin, a series of them. God sends a prophet to talk to David, probably about a year later. Prophet Nathan comes to talk to David. Amazing act of courage, Nathan comes to the king, tells him a story. He says, there's a rich man and a poor man. The rich man had many animals. The poor man only had one little lamb that he had raised from birth as his pet. This is not going to be an animal that he is going to kill and eat. He's just enjoying this animal. The rich man has a friend that comes into town, and the rich man doesn't want to kill any of his sheep to feed the friend. And so he takes the poor man's sheep and kills it and feeds it to his friend. Here's David's response. David thinking that this has actually happened in his kingdom. David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. 
He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. David is like, how could a man do such an evil thing? Take a little lamb that was a pet. Nathan responds to David, you're the rich man. You took Uriah's wife. David responds with great sorrow. 2 Samuel 12, 13 says, David confessed to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord, here we go. This is, this is when it gets better. Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you. You're not gonna die for this. You ever do something where you think, I, I, I'm not sure God can forgive me. I don't think I can forgive myself. I mean, put me in the category there. How can we move on? David writes some of the most powerful words in Psalm 51. This is a reflection, result of his activity. In Psalm 51, verse 1, he says, Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because I have, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion. Finally, it haunts me day and night against you, and you alone I have sinned, which is not necessarily true, right? Because it wasn't just about that. It was about... You're right, it was about, oh, all right, but here we go. I have done what is, right, what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say and your judgment against me is just. Verse 10 of chapter 51, and you know this one probably. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Don't banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and make me willing to obey you. Fast forward into the New Testament. Here we go. If we confess, right? So we can either cover up or confess. If we confess our sins to him, check this out. He's faithful and just, just as David had proclaimed years and years ago. He's faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from, and here's the best word in the entire Bible. To cleanse me from what? Oh, are you kidding me? Not just some, not most. Of, oh, it's all of it. David found grace in God's great love. Sometimes I think that God could never forgive some of the stuff I've done. I'm too far gone. He's too distant. Remember that? It's like, I don't even know. In fact, some of you have been so hesitant about giving your life to him because you think, I don't think he can do it. I don't think it's for me. I don't think, I've, after all I've done, and I mean, if, I, if you know, if people would know, and like, oh, Jesus, please, right? And I want to be forgiven, but I'm not sure it's possible that the good news of Jesus Christ is, is for everyone. Yes, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory. None of us are, right? None of us are worthy of heaven. I love this song by Steve Camp. When you give in to that familiar sin, he is all you need. You ever feel like this? Guilt has you paralyzed. It slowly eats you alive, but he's all you need. He'll be faithful to you, though your heart is untrue and your love's grown cold. His forgiveness is real. It'll comfort and heal your sin-weary soul. He is all you need. And if God could do that for David, listen to me, if God can do that for David, he can do that for you. A heart after, a man after God's own heart. It's a heart of repentance.
This is for you. This is for me. This is for everyone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever, whoever, right? Whoever, doesn't even matter. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter. In fact, the good news is that today he does not even remember your sin. Ever. It is gone from the record. It has been paid for and thrown away and discarded into the pits of hell. It no longer is you or defines you. You are a child of the King of Kings. And He loves you with an everlasting love that includes the forgiveness of our sin. Golly. Let's pray. For some of us in the room today, we're just not sure that that's real. You see, you feel so dirty, so messed up, so unlovable, unforgivable. And if this could be true, really true, that if right now, right here, we would confess to you ask you to forgive us of our sins, you would cleanse us, that we could be clean. You're crying out loud. Are you kidding me? So here in this moment in time, perhaps we are aware, certainly aware of our sin, but we're going to grab a hold of grace. In Christ we pray, amen.